Good morning, and I trust that it is a good morning for you. Uh, we can say of a truth that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, and I hope and trust and pray that you have found reason to rejoice in this day today. For the Lord is still good, irrespective of what's going on in our lives. We're happy to be able to come your way once again today in this period of, of Bible study and reflection as we delve one more time into the Word of God that we, the saints of God, might be edified thereby. And uh, we're happy to come your way as we say it. We want you to now contact somebody else if you haven't done it already. Let them know we're on there. Give them this web address, fmbcno.org. fmbcno.org. Call them up. Give them this address. Have them tune in that they might be able to receive a blessing as well. Now, as usual, this is the time for Bible study. So we say to you, get your Bible, get your notepad, get your pen, and let us pre prepare to make our way into the Word of God uh, that we might know what the Lord has to say to us on today. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your loving kindness and for your tender mercy toward us. Thank you, dear God. You continually look beyond our faults and supply our every need. Thank you, dear God, for your mercy, your grace, your salvation, so full and so free. Thank you, dear God, for the redemption that, that you purchased for us with the blood of your son, Jesus the Christ. Thank you that he died, was buried, and arose from the dead and ascended back to your right hand where he now lives, making intercession for us, and one day is coming back again for the body of believers. Dear Lord, as we come now, we are conscious of the fact that we have sinned, we have failed, we have faltered along the way. Dear God, we have frustrated you, we have hurt you, we have even angered you at times, Lord. Have mercy upon us according to your loving kindness and according to the multitude of your tender mercy. Blot out our transgressions, dear God. Grant us a closer walk with thee. Help us now, dear God, as we attempt to impart your word, to rightly divide your word. We pray, dear God, that we might be able to not only uh, impart it, but the hearers might be able to receive it and that the hearers might be able to share it with others as they go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, hopefully you got your Bibles and uh, your notepad and your pen, and you're ready to go with us into the Word of God. Uh, as you know, those of you who've been walking with us, uh, we have been dealing in this subject at length, of apostasy and in particular uh, of late we've been talking about what the believers must do in this period in this time in this day of apostasy we've already talked about what apostasy is we don't need to redefine it just need to say one little brief thing it is a falling away if you if you remember that you got it it is a falling away it is a falling away from the faith. It is when one has made an open, a public confession or has, or has been numbered among the believers but has turned away from the faith, which gives a sign that that person never really was. He was the only one in number or visibly, all right, he was in the visible church, not the invisible church, all right? And has fallen away, has renounced, has turned back, has gone away. It's no longer, not simply no longer in the church, no longer in the faith. And I made that distinction for you some time ago. So we've been talking of late about what the believer must do 
in the light of the fact that we are now living in the day, in the age of apostasy. What the believer must do. All right. And we also say it. This is an important factor too as well. That the apostasy, the day of apostasy, is indicative of or a part of the latter days or the last days. We believe that we're living in the latter days. Apostasy is a sign of that. Men, women, boys, and girls are leaving the faith. All right? And we've talked about the fact that the believer must do at least two things in these latter days. One, be watchful. Another word for being watchful is the word alert. All right? Alert, be alert. Gregorio, watchful, alert. Watchful doesn't mean just sitting down. It means being alert, your spiritual eye open. All right? Watching for the signs of the time and also watching for the fulfillment of the word of God. So we say you must be watchful. And then the second thing we say is that the believer must be steadfast in the word or worded up. And we've been taking a lot of time of late talking about things that the word of God talks about as it relates to the believer. <coughs> we've had considerable discussion, all right? And we're going to resume that discussion today uh, talking about what the word of God says the believer should know and do and believe in these latter days, all right? And uh, as I said, we spent a lot of time uh, on, that, on that matter. Believers staying alert and believers staying in the word. Now, why must we stay in the word? Because we spent some time talking about the fact that the word of God keeps us. The idea behind keeping is to guard or protect, all right? Like a military guard, like a soldier who is on guard at the gate. The word of God guards us, protects us, keeps us, all right? It, 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 it guards, it protects in the sense of what? Our, our eyes and our ears are gates through which things enter. Mm -hmm. Your mouth is another gate through which things exit. All right? So guess what? I need to be guarded or protected mm -hmm, from what I see and what I hear as well as from what I say myself. And the word of God does that for me when I abide by it. All right? When I abide by it. I have to put that in there. The word of God keeps you. And also, the word of God is important for the believer in these last days because the word of God also informs you. How can you know what to look for in these latter days? How can you know the signs of the time? How can you know th that Jesus' coming is nigh, is near, except you be informed by the word? People who are hoodwinked, people who are taken advantage of, people who are led astray with a hook in their nose, so to speak, are those who are not informed according to the word of God. So that is the reason why we must be alert and we must be steadfast in the word of God. And we have uh, spent some time uh, in, in the last few weeks talking about uh, some things that the word of God will do. I said, uh, I, I, I specified seven things that the word of God will do. 
Uh, I think we've got to five of them, you know. And uh, the last, uh, the last few weeks, we've been talking about how the Word of God will build you up, um, and and uh, that is how the Word of God will edify you. Those of you who've been with us, and um, we've also been talking about the fact of how the Word of God gives the believer an inheritance among the saints. All right. I have, I cannot leave this faith. Why? Because if I do it, I'm going to be leaving my inheritance. I'm not going to walk away from my inheritance. And we've been talking about that. How that the word of God must be seen as a will. If you've been walking with us, we've been talking about that. Go back and check your notes. Those of you, some of you are good note takers. All right. Uh, go back to Hebrews chapter 9. All right. Where you will see there, beginning at verse 13, and you will read the, uh, there uh, in that passage that it talks about the New Testament. All right. I've been pounding on that, all right? The New Testament. And we see these 27 books that we call the New Testament as that, all right? Uh, the Old Testament, the word testament, the concept is that of an agreement. Yeah, we got that. You say, Pastor, we got that. We've been going over that over and over and over again. I have told you so many times that repetition is the mother of memory, all right? And I, I, I repeat things, not because I don't have something else to say, but because I need, to get you, I need you to really get that. All right? The, the idea of a testament is that of, of a covenant or an agreement, specifically referring to the 39 books of the Old Testament. But when you come, as the writer says in Hebrews chapter 9, to the New Testament, it is more than a covenant or an agreement. It is a will. The very language, the very terminology that is used flowing out of the Greek uh, gives us to know that it is a will because you're talking about a testator. All right? And uh, it talks there about how the testator, what? The will only takes force. Hebrews chapter 9. The will only takes force when the testator dies. Huh? And we journey it on to St. Matthew chapter 26 uh, at verse 28. And we saw Jesus sitting at the table with his disciples observing the Passover for the last time with them. And how he took the cup and said, this is my blood. This is the symbol of my blood. And what that's talking about death. I mean, he's getting ready to die. Uh, which is the what? My, my blood in the New Testament. My blood is shed for you. All right? So what Jesus was saying there is that what? When I die, the will takes force. I'm signing it in my blood. It only takes force when I die. This New Testament, what? This new agreement took force. And Jesus died. So what we have here in the New Testament is a will. Right? Acts chapter 20, verse 32, we saw what the Apostle Paul said to the Ephesian elders. What? I commend you to God and to the word, the word of God, the word of his grace, which is able to edify you or build you up and give you an inheritance among, among all them which are sanctified. All right? An inheritance. And, and we read that we have an inheritance, what? In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 11 tells us that we have an inheritance. Hmm? Yeah. We have an inheritance. I... I will not leave the faith. If I leave the faith, I leave my inheritance. 
And listen, in, 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 in his will, in his word, his word is his will. In his will, I receive an inheritance in time and in eternity. That is to say, there are things that I receive now in time, and there are things that I receive after a while in eternity. All right? I, listen, we went through it with you. We receive the Holy Spirit. The believer does. Hmm? Now, that's not important to, you know, to, 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 to the average Joe Blow. The average person doesn't see that as being significant. As important. Why? Because, and this is why we have to be careful about what we preach and teach in the church. Because uh, that, there are those who have made you believe that uh, the only thing, the only kind of stuff we receive from God is material stuff. But we took our time, and, and Lord, we, did, we didn't even begin to scratch the surface. I want to tell you. We read St. John chapter 14. As a matter of fact, those of us who are students of the scripture know you take your time and read the whole 14th chapter, the whole 15th chapter, the whole 16th chapter. And there you will see how Jesus Christ makes a promise that what? When I go away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will come. And everything that I've been doing for you, he's going to do for you in my physical absence. And that, the, which, when I read it, it helps me to know and understand and remember and believe that there are things that I need God to do for me that material th things ca can't provide. And the Holy Spirit does a great work for me and in me. Jesus said to his disciples, I am going, but you're in my will. I'm not going to, remember, I, I, we read, Jesus said to his disciples, I will not leave you comfortless. And I explained to you what that idea of being comfortless meant. And those of you who, who, who may not have been with us, I talked about the fact that Jesus was their master, their teacher. And, and, and in those days, what? The pupils of the teacher were regarded as being his children. And so for the pupils to be left without their teacher was to be orphaned. So when Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless, he was saying to them, I will not leave you as orphans. Remember that? So more than stuff, I need to be able to live in this world without being orphaned. Because I'm one of his disciples. And Lord have mercy, where would I be without him? So he makes a promise. He says, what? I'm about to die. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die. And I'm going to go away. But you're in the will. I will not leave you orphaned. And I will only illustrate for you how that any good parent, what, who, who is faced with the prospect of no longer being in this world, is concerned, and I will say even worried, what, how are my children going to make out without me being here? Jesus said, don't worry about it. I got you in the will. It's taken care of. So we, we, we read St. John chapter 14, verse 26. We read St. John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. We read St. John chapter 16 and verse 7. Huh? We read St. John chapter 14 and verse 18. But those whole chapters, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. And uh, what? He's in the will for you. He's in my will for you. 
And uh, we went on to talk a little bit about at least a couple of things that the Holy Spirit does. Hmm? As we were reading these passages. We, we went on uh, to talk about the fact that the Holy Spirit uh, adopts. The Holy Spirit adopts. We are in a family now. We have been adopted. Look into your notes. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Talks about us having been adopted. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 talks about us, what? As having been adopted. Hmm? We've been adopted. And that has to do with our inheritance, yes. That has to do with being in his will. Because what? An adopted child has all the rights of a biological child. So once we were adopted and we're clear the Holy Spirit is the agent in our adoption. All right? And when, when we're adopted, well, we're in the family. And we're entitled to all the rights. And we become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything he's entitled to, we're entitled to it. All right? He does that for us. He does. And, and then we went on to talk about how, I think the last time we were together, how the Holy Spirit seals us. Remember now, the Holy Spirit has a multifaceted ministry. We, Lord, I can't even scratch the surface on all that the Holy Spirit does. But the Holy Spirit seals us. Hmm? We read in Ephesians chapter 1. We read it. Look back in your notes. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. All right? That the Holy Spirit seals us. Also, we, we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. That the Holy Spirit seals us. Huh? As a matter of fact, let's just, let me just read that again for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. All right? 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. That we are sealed. All right. Here, here it is. I'm going to read verse 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit, Spirit is capitalized, in our hearts. Hmm. Praise his name. All right. Uh, let's turn over. Stay in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All right. And let's go down to verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5 says, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Now you notice in that first verse we read, verse 22 of chapter 1, he says he has sealed us and given us the earnest of of the spirit in our hearts. Now, in the next verse that we just read, it doesn't talk about the sealing. It talks about the fact once again that it's given us the earnest, all right, the earnest of the spirit. You remember uh, we talked about the, what that meant. Word earnest. Well, what, what does that mean? The guarantee. Guarantee. A guarantee. In other words, this was God's way. This was God's way of guaranteeing what He said. 
You know, I can believe everything that God has said that has not happened yet based upon that which he has promised that has already happened. He promised that he would leave, for example, that he would leave and the Holy Spirit would come. He promised that he would ascend and that the Holy Spirit would descend. Acts chapter 1, the Holy Spirit, Jesus ascended, and Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descended. And every believer Everyone who is regenerated or born again receives the Holy Spirit. That's a guarantee of everything else that he has promised as it relates to the Holy Spirit, as it relates to the Holy Spirit, and anything else he has promised to come. My, my, my. He has sealed us, and, 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 and let us remember let us not forget, all right? Let us not forget what a seal does. Because somebody is, is tuning in today. He said, well, what does that mean? He sealed, the Holy Spirit seals us. Well, you got to rem remember the custom or know the customs of those old times, all right? When a document was finished, in, in order to protect the contents of the document, they sealed it. In order to show ownership of the one who was sending it, they protected it by sealing it. And I made reference to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 a moment ago where the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Meaning that what? I am under the protection of the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. When is the day of redemption? Now here's why I can't be lost when Jesus comes back. I didn't make that up. Paul said it. We are sealed unto the day, not until, he says, unto. <coughs> sealed unto the day of redemption. So, that, that's in the will. In other words, guaranteed. All right? We talked about that. How the Spirit of God adopts us, how the Spirit of God seals us. Huh? Yeah. Now, let me, let me move on to something else that he does, that's in his will for us. And that the Holy Spirit does yeah, play, play a part in that. Something that it seems so, that seems so simple to us. You know what else is in the will for us? And this is why a true believer, a one who's really a believer, does not fall away. Peace. That's in the will for us. One, one thing, one of many things that he does for us when he saves us is he grants us We get the peace of God, and we get peace with God. Now, let's see. Let's see if I'm right. Let's go back to the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. St. John chapter 14. And when you read, when I call you to this verse, I want you to read this verse thinking about the context. All right. And this is where a lot of people make their mistake when they try to, you know, read the Bible. They don't read it. They don't read it thinking about context. I'm going to call your attention to a verse here now. And if you think about context when you're reading it, it will open up 
and it will blossom for you. And here's the context. What's going on in John chapter 14? Jesus is informing his disciples, what? I'm going to leave you. All right? He starts out the 14th chapter telling them, let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because at the close of chapter 13, they're disturbed. They're upset. They're bothered. So chapter 14 opens up. That familiar passage. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. That's the context. In my father's house are many mansions. Huh? I'll go away to prepare a place for you. You know it. But when you read chapter 14 now, let's, let's, let's come on down to verse 27. Think about context now when you read verse 27, all right? This is Jesus talking, all right? Peace I leave with you. Notice those first words. Peace, he doesn't just simply say, I give it to you. And he's going to say, I give it to you in a minute. But he starts that verse out by saying, peace I leave with you. Uh, guess what? I am going. Now remember what I told you before now. This is the will. Say Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28. This is, this is the New Testament in my blood. This is a new arrangement. This is the will in my blood. I'm about to die. But you're in the will. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I told you at the outset of this lesson, the word of God keeps us, guards us, protects us. Hmm? What, 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 what did the apostle Paul say to that church at Philippi? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, what shall do what? Keep or guard or protect your heart and your mind. Jesus says here, peace I leave with you. I'm going. You're in the will. And one of the intangibles, all right, that I leave in the will for you is peace. Now, let's, 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 all right. The word peace, the word peace here is the word irene. E-I-R-E-N-E. That word, if you're taking your notes, underline that word peace. Irene. <laughs> kind of looks like an English name, huh? that we use, Irene, you know. Now, that word Irene, just think of one word. Contentment. Contentment. Jesus says here, and notice, again, context. Who is he talking to? He's not talking to the world. He's talking to his disciples, his followers. I, I leave you with contentment. I leave you, all right, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will have Contentment. Contentment. Now we're talking about apostasy. It is nothing short of miraculous 
that in this world of turmoil, in this world of strife, in this world of dissatisfaction, in this world of brokenness, in this world of sorrow, in this world of suffering, in this world of shame, in this world of misery, in this world where there's always something to rock the boat. It is nothing short of miraculous that the believer can live with a sense of contentment. Jesus says here, yeah, I got you covered. See, when you know you're in the will and you know the testator and you know what? He's dependable and you know that everything he has promised will come to pass, you can be content. And he makes a whole heap of promises in chapters 14, 15, and 16. Peace I leave. You got to keep repeating that to yourself. Peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. Guess what? Yes, I'm going, but I'm leaving something here with you that's going to hold you. Contentment. Now listen, I'm not happy about what's going on in this world, but I'm happy in spite of it. I'm not satisfied with the conditions what, in which we live, hmm? but I have peace and contentment in spite of it. That's beautiful. And then, and then, if you, if you, if you, just, just read the rest of this verse, what he says, "Peace I leave with you, my peace." Why, why, why is he saying his peace? I'll tell you why, because what he calls peace and what the world calls peace happens to be two different things. Polar opposites. Polar opposites. Diametrically opposed. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. What he's saying? He's saying, yeah, I don't give the kind of peace that the world gives. As a matter of fact, that which the world gives is not really peace. Jesus says here, I leave with you my last, I leave with you my best. I leave as a part of my dying legacy, peace, but not the kind that the world gives. What? Men have peace societies, peace plans, peace temples. <laughs> and in the midst of all of that, they're armed for war. Hmm? The Secretary of State of the United States gets on the big jet, flies all around the world, sitting at tables, having, having conferences, having meetings, signing papers for peace. What? The whole time, the, while he's signing the paper for peace, the Congress is, 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 is wanting, wanting to, uh, what, 
make a big budget for, for what? For all. There's no, that, that's not peace. And even, even, in the, even in this day in which Jesus speaks here in this text, what? Men refuse to recognize him as the prince of peace. They ignore him. And that's why there will be no true peace until Jesus Christ returns what, to reign on the earth. And so what is it since apostasy is a sign of the latter days and we read in the word of God based on the words of Jesus Christ but that the latter days things will get more and more turbulent the men will wax worse. What is it that sustains us? Not running away from him, what? But resting in his peace that he has guaranteed for us. He has left that for us. And then based upon that, he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What? I, in spite of all that's transpiring, I do not have to live in fear. As a believer in Christ Jesus, I can live in peace. Now listen. That's the peace of God, which, as I forestated, Paul talks about it in the book of Philippians. The peace of God passing, that passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and our minds. Contentment. Hmm? The heart being the seat of the emotion and the mind being the seat of the intellect. I don't feel flustered. Hmm? And I don't go out of my mind. You know, just this morning, all right, uh, when this is being aired, I should say yesterday morning, but out in California, you think the man was at peace? Walks in the place and shoots up all the people? He's not contented. He doesn't have peace. He doesn't have contentment on the inside. Guess what? When you are contented on the inside, you don't disturb what your surroundings. You don't, you don't bring disturbance. You br when you are at peace, you bring peace wherever you go. You, listen, as the Holy Spirit is the agent of peace in you, you become the agent of peace to others around you. In these last days, the believer is at peace. He has peace of God. But listen, he not only has the peace of God, he also has peace with God. Hmm? Uh, I said to you that word irene uh, means contentment. But let's, let's just flip over to a somewhat familiar passage uh, to some of us in the book of Romans. Paul's letter to the church at Rome, all right? Romans chapter 5, all right? In Romans chapter 5, uh, I'm just going to read verse 1. All right? Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Yeah. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that verse talks about peace, right? Mm -hmm. And it says that peace is connected to justification. That's what the verse says. Therefore, being justified by faith, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just finished talking about the peace of God. Now, Paul talks about peace with God. Still talking about contentment. But here, here is here is a definition of peace from the salvific perspective. All right? As, that is, as it relates to our salvation. It is the contentment that arises out of being in a right relationship with God. So when you, when you read Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, you take it a little further. It's not only contentment, but it is the contentment that arises out of being in a right relationship with God. Meaning what? There is no longer any contention between God and me since I'm saved. Because the verse says, therefore being justified by, by faith. See, that's why a lot, of people don't, a lot of people in church don't understand, don't understand how important faith is. It is faith, all right? It is faith that causes us to be justified. And when we are justified, we have peace with God. Just like that. Faith, justification, peace. He that cometh to God must believe. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. He that cometh to God must believe. Once you truly believe, then you are justified. When you are justified, you have peace. That is, contentment. That is, you are no longer an adversary or an enemy of God. You have peace with God. My goodness. Let's see, let's look at it this way. Justification, and I've said this before, is God's judicial act. It is the act whereby God, through his sovereign grace, all right, though we are guilty, guilty, all right, though we are guilty sinners, standing before him damned and doomed in God's court, once we truly and sincerely believe on him and confess him, he justifies us. And in that justification act, God, as the judge, wraps the gavel and declares that we are right with him, justified, just. The root just, right. Justified. At peace, the contentment that arises out of a right relationship with God. I 
I want to go into that a little bit further, and I won't do it today. I'll do it next week. But listen, as the age comes to a close, as the day comes to a close, as the day of his approach comes, to a clo comes closer, I have no need to fear as a believer. I have no need to be upset. I have no need to be nervous. Why? Because all is well between God and me. I got the peace of God, what? Which, which settles me, what? With all these circumstances around me, and I got peace with God, which settles, which settles me with what? With my relationship with him. So guess what? I'm not dreading the day of redemption. I'm looking forward to it. Ah, but if you don't know the word, if you're not settled in the word, if you're not alert and worded up, you don't know these things, and it becomes easy for you to fall away because you're really not in the faith. It is, it, is, it, is, it is impossible for someone to truly and sincerely, right, and, and rightly be in the word. And when I say rightly, I mean rightly dividing it. It is impossible for that, for that person to fall away. The word keeps him. The Holy Spirit keeps him. The peace of God keeps him. I'll go on into that more next week. All right. But we will we will leave that where it is for today. And uh Hope that you received some nuggets from the Word of God as we have shared with you on today. Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Dear God, our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for this blessed opportunity. Thank you once again for your Word, for your people. Dear God, help us to delve deeper into your Word and to become more and more convinced of your word and to believe it more and more as we go. Bless the remainder of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.